So uh, I, I welcome you all today. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, friend and colleague, um, Carlos Garza. Um, and I had knew it. I thought I, I expected sort of that I was going to give the the intro to him. So I was sort of looking online to try to figure out some data so I could send. And then um, um, Michael Lee sent me a, his bio that he was going to do if I didn't do it. So I'm just going to read Michael's because it's much better than the one I would have said. Oh, so okay. So this is Carlos talking about himself. No. Um, so Carlos is a supervisory research geneticist in the fisheries ecology division of NOAA's Southwest Fisheries Science Center, which if um, and the office, the main lab he works in is in Santa Cruz, and an adjunct professor in the Department of Ocean Sciences at the University of UC Santa Cruz. Carlos leads the molecular ecology and genetics analysis lab, or team, a joint NOAA UC Santa Cruz group that develops and uses molecular genetic data and analytical methods to address questions related to ecology, evolution, conservation, and management of marine and aquatic animals and ecosystems. And I don't think he says it in here, but um, primarily he's been doing a lot of work recently on mostly on salmonids and rockfishes, um, which is the most recent thing that we collaborated on. Ah, yep, and there's a rockfish on the right and the salmonid on the left, just to confirm that. Um, he has more than 25 years' experience in the application of genetic methods to conservation and management issues, and his work is used to inform resource managers at the international, regional, tribal, and local levels. His work has been published in nearly 100 journal articles and technical reports and has been reported on extensively, including in the New York Times, San Francisco Chronicle, and the Science Magazine. He has served as on multiple federal technical recovery and biological review teams for salmon and trout and on the scientific and statistical committee of the Pacific Fisheries Management Council as well as on the California Hatchery Scientific Review Group. He currently serves on the faculty advisory committee of the University of California's President's Postdoctoral Fellowship Program and as an editor of the journal of Conservation Genetics. Following his original scientific work re researching monkey genetics in Thailand, he, he somehow found his way to NOAA in in 1999, and he's been working with fish ever since. According to the New York Times feature article we shared with you earlier this week, he's known as the salmon matchmaker and, it, and for being the brains behind a dating service for fish. Um, oftentimes they're dead when, he, when that dating service happens, but <laughs> because of his work in conservation of, of native uh, salmon stocks by facilitating, identifying, selecting, and maximizing the mating of individuals that are not genetically related. We're going to learn about more about what the, this very cool work he's been doing and with this paper, but I just wanted to give you his background. So he's a UC San Diego grad, went undergrad there, master's degree, got his PhD at UC Berkeley, right? <laughs> yeah, at Berkeley. Um, so today we're going to hear a large amount about some of the work he's been doing using genetics as a tool for looking at life history in fishes. So Carlos, it's up to you. That's a bio that I sent to Michael Lee that I put together when I was asked to serve on a panel by Larry Page's brother. Um, and so I figured I needed to puff myself up and look um, experienced and important. And uh, so that's why I kind of put it all together. Is that on? Do you, um, green light? Yes. OK. Great. All right. So. Um, I'm going to talk today about a couple of the major areas of research that we've been engaged in over the last few years in my research group. We have um, quite a large program with over 50 named projects, so um, uh, out of necessity I'm only going to talk about um, a small fraction of what we do, and I'm not going to talk at all about the, the work on um, what we call um, genetic broodstock management for inbreeding avoidance, which uh, the New York Times wanted to call uh, salmon matchmaking. Um, it, it's quite important um, from a conservation point of view, but um, scientifically it's less interesting. So I'm going to tell you uh, about some of the work we've been doing with salmonids and with rockfishes and give you sort of a smattering of um, results from the, the various things that we do. Um, and uh, I think that the, the intro bio um, gave you a fairly um, good idea of what the focus of my research group is, um, population and molecular genetics of marine and anadromous organisms, fishes primarily. 
um, to answer a whole variety of questions in population biology, including uh, inference about population structure, um, subdivision, um, and, and size, estimation of size, both uh, census size and also effective population size. Um, population history, um, trying to understand behavior by tracking individual fish and understanding the relationships between them and how that might structure their behavioral ecology. What, one of the main areas of real um, novel research in, in my group is a methodology for um, both uh, understanding pedigree relationships and then using them to understand the biology of the organisms um, in which we're inferring them. Uh, we work on detecting natural selection and trying to understand the mechanisms by which it operates. Uh, one of the large things that we've been doing over the last few years and one of the projects I'm going to talk about with some very exciting and brand new results hot off the press is trying to understand dispersal. And, and we've done that quite successfully with um, salmon and other fishes that spend some of their time in fresh water. It's a lot easier to, to um, get a hold of them and, and to track them. But to do it in the open ocean is a lot more difficult. And um, we're starting to do that now, um, almost through brute force. Uh, individual discrimination, think DNA fingerprinting. The, the data that we collect is um, appropriate for it and um, allows us to identify individuals um, at multiple times in um, their life if they've been sampled more than once. Um, and I'm not going to talk about this uh, today, but it's a really large portion of what we're doing now. Um, and that is probably all of you have heard that, um, well, you probably first have heard that salmon and trout um, throughout their range are generally in decline. And a lot of the populations and subspecies, if you will, of salmon and trout um, are protected under the Federal and State Endangered Species Act. And um, as a consequence of that, there's a lot of effort that's going into reintroducing them to former habitat um, that hasn't been available to them for, in some cases, over a century. Um, and, and one of the more significant efforts that is well underway um, uh, is, has occurred just down the road with the removal of one of the big dams on the Carmel River, largely to facilitate um, the the restoration of that river, the natural hydrograph, and to increase population sizes for the ESA-listed steelhead that live in that basin. A much larger one is poised to um, happen in the next couple of years. Uh, in fact, far and away the largest ever with the removal of five dams on the Klamath River, something we've been involved in um, since the beginning um, when it became, ooh, um, something weird happening here. Um, Uh-oh. Uh, that's not what I want to do. It came up, uh, it just was telling me that I needed, it's trying to log me into something or other. Um, and, uh, and, and so uh, we're, we're trying to figure out how you do that. We're working now, for example, on reintroducing salmon to the San Joaquin River, the second largest river in California. Um, life history evolution, trying to understand the mechanisms by which elements of um, the life history of the organisms we study are changing. Um, fishery stock proportions, I'll talk a little bit about that. Th that's just sort of a straightforward process of understanding what it is that um, fishermen are harvesting. Because often, the, the way that fishery landings are reported is not congruent with um, the, the scale at which they're managed. So we might, for example, um, know that they're harvesting um, Chinook salmon, but we don't know whether they're harvesting the endangered winter run Chinook salmon or the, um, the fishery target uh, fall run Chinook salmon. Uh, uh, most Chinook salmon in California, certainly in the Central Valley, are produced in hatcheries. And hatcheries are big breeding experiments. And um, we have been working very diligently over the last decade or so to try to put the, the practices of these hatcheries on a firmer scientific basis and monitor what they're doing to make sure that they're achieving the outcomes that they're intending to. And then 
Um, the very last one of these here is genetics. All this other stuff that we talk about is not really genetics. It's molecular ecology. It's using genetic data and, and inference to answer other questions about biology. But genetics, strictly speaking, is the study of inheritance of traits. And, and we do that. And, and we're quite interested in understanding and, and trying to uh, elucidate the specific genetic components of life history variation in fish. And, and unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about that today, even though it's some of the more exciting stuff we're doing, because it's still in, in fairly early stages. So the, the first thing I want to point out um, when I, before I start to talk about Chinook salmon is that salmon are ocean fishes. And people forget this. Um, they, they don't realize that um, salmon spend the vast majority of their lives at sea. In California, the vast majority of Chinook salmon, for example, spend six months, maybe up to eight months in fresh water before they head to the ocean and spend anywhere from two to five years in the ocean. But almost all of our effort in studying Chinook salmon is in fresh water because, as I mentioned, that's where it's easier to get your hands on them and see them. And people become very, very attached to the, the salmon when they're spending the relatively short period of their lives in fresh water. And part of the, the reason for, for that is also because, as I hope to impress upon you in, in this talk, the ocean is large. And finding fish, finding specific fish of a specific species, or what we like to do, which is follow individual fish, is extremely challenging. Um, and so we have largely overlooked what goes on in the ocean for salmon and tried to manage them based on what we've learned about their life history in fresh water. But that's really inadequate for proper management. So where do I have to point this thing? Oh, actually, it's not up top. Um, uh, so Chinook salmon um, is, is not a monolithic entity. There are over 200 genetically distinct populations of Chinook salmon range wide. And they range all the way from Russia to California, uh, in fact. We are more or less exactly at the southern end of, of the range um, right here in Monterey Bay. The southern end of the range is in the Central Valley in the San Joaquin River, but just right over the hill at about the same latitude. Um, and, and, and they're hugely important um, economically. The, the fishery in California in, in most years um, accounts for 100 to $200 million in economic activity and over a billion dollars in the entire um, Pacific Ocean, maybe more. Um, and, and so the, what, and I, and I forgot to mention, even though there are all these types of genetically distinct Chinook salmon, for the most part, they're not visually distinguishable. They all look alike. And even though fishermen will tell you, for example, that they can always tell apart fish from the Sacramento River and the Klamath River, I can assure you that they're, they can't. Um, <laughs> because uh, sometimes they do a little bit better than random, but only a little bit. Um, so one of the ways um, that we, in fact, the primary way that we, um, actually maybe not, that one of the ways that we um, distinguish these otherwise indistinguishable Chinook salmon um, is using genetic stock identification. And genetic stock identification is a fairly straightforward process which uses a reference database of genotypes, of genetic profiles of individuals of known origin um, and, and compare that genotype or the genetic profile of an individual of unknown origin to these different reference populations and use a probabilistic, a statistical methodology to identify that fish to its most likely population of origin. Um, a former student of mine um, constructed a um, a baseline reference database for 96 um, single nucleotide polymorphisms. I'm going to tell you a lot more about those later. Um, in Chinook salmon, typed in 8,000 fish for all of the populations and stocks found in California in any appreciable frequency. And, and th this is, uh, the number's about the same in, in Oregon as well. A and so it allows us to solve what we call the redfish bluefish problem. So, um, the, and that is the mixed fishery problem and, and the, the, the fact that even though fish of quite um, distinct uh, ancestry and life history are um, segregated in freshwater, in the ocean they're all mixed together. And, and some of those stocks, as I mentioned, 
um, are rare and protected and others are abundant and can be harvested. And in California, um, the, the main stocks, the most common ones are Central Valley Fall, Klamath River, Fall and Spring, Coastal California, Central Valley Spring, these last two are ESA listed. And then I, I, don't, um, I didn't list here California, um, Central Valley or Sacramento River um, winter run, which is the critically endangered one because um, and critically endangered means rare, and rare means we almost never see it in um, fisheries, particularly north of, um, north of the Golden Gate, which is where most of our work has been focused over the last few years. So we realized a few years ago that, in fact, um, if we're going to learn about the ocean, we need to take advantage of the largest um, ocean salmon sampling project out there, which is the commercial fishery. And as much as um, a lot of fishery science, uh, scientists sort of shy away from what we call fishery dependent data collection, there's just no other way to get the sort of sampling that, um, that is necessary to start to make sense of what's going on in the ocean without taking advantage of this. So what we um, started doing about 10 years ago is working with fishermen and um, the, the, the real unique element of our collaboration is that we give them um, GPS units and um, ask them to collect the exact GPS, GPS coordinates of the catch location for individual fish and, uh, and also, very importantly, to um, collect GPS track lines for all the fishing efforts, so whenever they have hooks in the water, and they all then correlate that information with um, samples from um, fish that are um, individually um, identifiable and for which we do the genetic stock identification and age analysis. I won't talk about the age analysis, though. So, um, and part of the goal of that work is to try to understand um, the ocean distribution. With one, and we got the, the fishermen interested in this, um, because they're notoriously difficult to collaborate with for scientists by um, pitching to them an idea that they that we could start to get make um, progress on something they've wanted for a long time, which is that these these green I think they're green um, green lines. Sorry, I can't quite tell. Um, are the boundaries of fisheries fishery management areas? And there's a very large fishery management area off of the Golden Gate. Um, that goes all the way from Pigeon Point down near Half Moon Bay, um, down below Half Moon Bay, um, up to Point Arena. And, and they've wanted to split it at Point Reyes for a long time. And so we started um, working with them to try to, um, we sold this, this project to them on um, that basis. And so what I'm going to tell you about now is um, three years of data analysis. Um, work that was done with a, a variety of people, including a former postdoc in my lab. Um, and I'm going to um, j tell you about what we've learned from those three years, uh, w which is really a huge effort. 26,000 fish were sampled and genotyped um, in that um, three-year period. We're up to about 45,000 now, I think, in, in 2006. Um, and what this is is a heat map of all of the efforts. So this is from the Columbia River mouth here all the way down to Santa Barbara. This is where all of the participating fishermen were fishing. And you can kind of see the little black dots underneath there. And those are the, the catch locations. And, and I'll show you those a little more explicitly. And what that allowed us to do, um, combined with this comprehensive relatively um, comprehensive um, sampling of the coast along with the genetic stock identification um, and information about effort is to, um, to come up with um, per catch probabilities, um, uh, per hour um, catch probabilities. So really, really super fine scale um, estimates of how likely um, fishermen might be to encounter a fish from a particular stock in a particular area of the coast. And so this is 2010 through 2012. F uh, fish from the Eel River, which is part of the ESA-listed California Coastal Chinook ESU, 
And what you can see is that um, in some years, um, the probability of catching one of these ESA listed fish is um, quite low um, everywhere north of the California border and then becomes um, quite a bit higher um, until you get down to Point Arena and then um, drops off and becomes low again um, south of Point Arena. In, in other years, however, um, it can be quite high all the way down to Monterey Bay. Um, so we're starting to get um, an idea of what the relative prevalence of these stocks are in different parts of um, the, the, at their ocean range at different times of the year, and, and different years, too. Um, and, and so uh, we, we wanted to start to understand some of the mechanisms by which the, these fish are segregating um, or distributing themselves in the ocean. And um, th this is that, um, that same um, 2010 map but with all of the effort removed and just the dots of catch locations that are color-coded by the, um, the stock of origin that um, was determined by genetic stock identification. I don't expect you to be able to make out these individual dots. And, and then we wanted to know whether there were any associations with any of these um, oceanographic variables, um, um, things like simple aggregation, which turned out to be the most important. Um, fish are found close to their rivers of origin, um, not surprisingly. Um, ocean depth, catch depth, uh, sea surface temperature, and productivity measured as um, chlorophyll. And we started to see something interesting right away. Um, you, if you look and kind of squint, you can see that in the inshore area here, um, there is a real predominance of blue dots. These are the Central Valley, Sacramento River, San Joaquin River um, fish from both the um, fall run and the spring run. And it turns out to be uh, very much correlated with bathymetry. You can see the isobaths here. Um, and, and there is um, a v a, most of the fish that you find um, really in close are, um, are from the Central Valley. Um, and we, we immediately thought, wow, um, Central Valley um, Chinook tend to be found closer to shore, right? Um, and, and then we started looking, um, this is Point Reyes, um, further south, oh, I'm sorry, this, this area is Fort Bragg, further south, even stronger, um, this is um, Cordell Bank. Um, and um, we were all excited. And, and then we realized the value of the effort data. And what we found when we looked at, at that, and so this is, let me just walk you through this. This is um, density uh, by stock um, across the entire coast. Um, and the, the x-axis here is ocean bottom depth. So this is deeper and this is shallower. And um, the black line is the effort line. This is where fishermen were looking. And what you see actually um, and, and this is statistically, there, there, there are better statistics that I'm not going to show you that demonstrate this, is that in fact the Central Valley, these, the blue and the purple stocks, actually much more closely um, follow the effort um, pattern than do all these other stocks. So it was actually sort of the opposite of what it is that we thought. The Central Valley fish are found everywhere, and it's the other fish, the Klamath and the Rogue, and the fish from Northern California and Oregon that are found further offshore than um, random. And, and, and again, we have some um, uh, colleagues who believe that is likely to be associated with different species of krill. Um, so, of course, things are never that simple. And when we start looking um, at all of the correlates of um, stock distribution um, on a stock-by-stock -stock basis over multiple years, we see all kinds of different things. Um, in 2010, um, the, you can see these more northern stocks um, have a, uh, sorry, the black is, uh, you, you may recall I told you that, that, um, that the dominant factor in where these fish are found is how close they are to their natal river, and that's, the, that's always true. But in, in 2010, for example, um, the, the next most important factor was bottom depth, particularly for the northern stocks. In 2011, it was sea surface temperature. And in 2012, 
um, it was sea surface temperature for some and bottom depth for others. So we know that the ocean is a variable place and we know that organisms have re responses um, to um, these ocean variables um, that can be quite different um, in um, different times of the year. And what we're showing here is that it can even differ by population. Um, just to be clear, even though this is not definitive, we are starting finally to get a picture of what is structuring the, um, uh, what is structuring the ocean distribution and migration patterns of Chinook salmon on a population basis in the ocean. And even with this huge sample size, we're still just trying to wade through the variability and make sense of it, but we're making progress. Okay, so um, I'm gonna move on now and tell you about um, something else that is, um, is related to what I was just telling you about and is now sort of pervading most of our work, and that is um, genetic tagging. And um, w when I first started working on salmon um, in, in about the year 2000, um, I, I quickly learned that most of what we know about salmon in the ocean comes from the recovery of these tiny little pieces of wire called coda wire tags that are, um, that are inserted in, into salmon heads at a staggering, staggering scale. Um, over a billion salmon and steelhead have had these little pieces of wire shot into their heads with pneumatic guns. Um, over 700 miles of wire. Um, and, um, that, and, and the way that you recover these is you run a, a metal detector over the heads of these fish and then you lop the head off and dig through the fetid fish head under a microscope to try to find that little piece of wire and then you read it under a microscope. It's just a, an incredibly primitive method that just seems, seems so archaic that my, my geneticist, human geneticist friends, literally just broke down laughing when I told them about it. They were just like, you gotta be kidding me. They cut the heads off and, and they were you know, laughing at what a terrible job it would be to dig through those heads under a microscope. And it's not a good job. But, but more importantly, um, almost none of them are recovered. Less than two in 1,000 are ever recovered. So, um, 998 out of um, 1,000 of the, the juvenile fish that receive these tags are never seen again. It's incredibly inefficient. And, and if we could find a way to um, insert tags in parents, have them transmit the tags to their offspring, um, and, and a Chinook salmon female, for example, typically has um, juvenile um, when she spawns. We, we would dramatically reduce the scope of the tagging problem and, and really make it a lot more efficient. And, and you never have to deal with tagging juveniles. Well, what is it that, in fact, all parents transmit to all their progeny? Well, of course, it's DNA. Um, and, and we sort of quickly realized that um, you could replace, um, f in, in most um, scenarios, um, the coda wire tag using a genetic based tag. And it's just a very simple process of genotyping parents, whether you catch them in, um, at a weir as they're heading upriver up to spawn at a hatchery. You catch them in a catch and release um, uh, fishery and genotype them with a set of markers like these single nucleotide polymorphisms I'm gonna tell you about. And then you sample and genotype the offspring generation with the same markers, and then you do parentage analysis, you know, the type that you read about in CSI when they want to figure out, you know, who the, fa the father is of, um, you know, the, uh, uh, or whatever, you know, it's a standard pedigree reconstruction, although we did have to develop a whole new um, type of um, statistical framework to do this because of the, the large numbers of comparisons. And, and so by genotyping just two parents, you effectively tag all of their thousands of offspring, and you never have to handle the juveniles, and you can get much higher tagging rates than are currently achieved. Currently in California, the standard is to tag about 25% of hatchery fish. Um, and it really transforms the way that we use these data um, for, into an individual DNA um, fingerprint framework with all individuals considered as, um, as um, 
potential nodes and pedigrees, um, and, and then if they're not a node and a pedigree, then they get rolled over into one of these more indirect methods of analysis. I'm going to skip over this, other than just to tell you in a paper that we published uh, about 10 years ago, we showed that you only needed about 100 of these SNPs to um, do this in, 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 in such a way that you would essentially never make errors, a false positive rate of less than one fish, um, uh, one parental pair assigned to a fish per 300,000 fish sampled. Of course, at that time, we didn't have 100 SNPs for um, Chinook salmon or for any of our species, so we had to get to work and, and discover them. And we actually did. And, 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 and this is a, a classic case of the technology um, catching up with the, the question. Um, in about 2009, um, this technology came out from, um, of a lab at, at Stanford, and, and it uses nanofluidic circuitry to, uh, to mix nanoliter uh, fractions of um, DNA samples here. This is for steelhead and gene probes here, and, and this is a 48 by 48 version of those. We use the 96 by 96 version, and in just a few hours, um, you get a, a 96 locus genotype for 96 fish, which is enough to do just about any of the pedigree reconstruction we want to do. And it's relatively inexpensive. We can generate um, four to uh, 600 um, such genotypes in a day in my lab. So really, really high throughput. Um, and now I'm going to just tell you quickly about um, one of the more salient applications, one of the first really nice applications with steelhead, which um, are the sea run version of rainbow trout. They are the closest relative of the Pacific salmon, Chinook, Coho, Sockeye salmon, more closely related to Pacific salmon um, than they are to, say, brown trout. And um, so, so really, um, and the reason that they're trout is, well, um, there are two reasons. One is that they don't have to go to sea. Um, they can stay in freshwater their entire lives. And the other is that they don't die when they spawn. They're, they're iteroparous, unlike almost all other salmon, all other Pacific salmon species. Um, and, and these are people who used to work um, in the lab in Santa Cruz. Um, with, and these are um, in Scott Creek, which is right up in northern Santa Cruz County. Um, big, beautiful steelhead that um, are part of a big long-term study we have there. But I'm going to tell you about fish from the Russian River because that's where we've got um, more samples and, and for a place in which my um, former graduate student, Alicia Abadia Cardoso, um, focused her work. And um, in this work, um, she looked at uh, about um, 3,500 returning adults over the course of five, six years um, at a um, at, at two um, traps, fish traps, that are at the termini of an anadromy in the two major branches of the Russian River, Dry Creek, um, and up here, oh, it's actually should be right there, um, at uh, uh, Coyote Valley um, Dam and um, Hatchery. And, and I'm only going to talk about the Warm Springs Hatchery um, results um, today because they're the, the better ones. And, and what we wanted to know here, and, and we, we learned a lot, but I'm just going to tell you about the one most salient result here. Um, we wanted to know whether the day at which individual fish returned um, from sea over the four-month period when they returned from about December to March um, was entirely environmentally determined or whether there was a heritable, a genetic component. And the answer is there's a very strong genetic component. And what we did here is we used um, the, the most classical method for understanding the heritable component of a variation in a phenotypic trait. This was a, a method that was developed by Charles Darwin's cousin, um, Francis Galton, to understand the heritable component of human height in the late 1800s. And, and it's just a simple parent-offspring regression. Um, that's this one here. And what we found with that um, method, and also with another method which does something similar, this is a sibling-sibling regression. This looks at the date of spawning of um, two full siblings, and, and again, they are um, going to be born on the same day. Um, so there's some uh, autocorrelation here. But 
But um, we found a very high um, a, a very high estimate of heritability here. Um, this is very high, trust me, for a, a complex trait like this. And, and we found a very similar um, heritability value for both males and females using both of these methods. So the date at which individuals return to spawn over this four month period is strongly influenced by the date which their, in which their parents spawn. And, and another way you can look at that, this, which is not as, um, uh, for, and doesn't have the same formal genetic model underlying it, is remember I told you that unlike their cousins, the salmon, these fish um, can return to, um, they, they can go back to sea after they spawn and come back in subsequent years to spawn again. And again, if there's a heritable component to it, then there should be a correlation between their first date of spawning and their second date of spawning when they come back a year or two later. And indeed there is, and, and the correlation is almost identical. So very strong evidence for, um, for heritability of timing of reproduction. And this has a lot of consequences for the way that we manage these fish. If you imagine, for example, the, a hatchery program, and there are about 10 steelhead hatchery programs in California. If you imagine that a hatchery program is going to be um, is going to be uh, selecting just a small fraction of the fish um, that they, um, from all the fish that come in as broodstock for their, to produce their juveniles, if they don't perfectly mimic the run timing distribution, the date of the distribution of eight, eight, uh, date of entry of the fish that they're trying to, um, to, uh, to produce, they're gonna be inducing selection on run timing and that Selection on run timing could have consequences for fitness down the line. If, for example, these fish have evolved in this way so that they, it's always the case that some fish enter when the estuary is open to the ocean and available, for example. And another consequence of this is that um, if you think about it, um, if in fact in a situation where fish do not have the opportunity to choose their own mates, but in fact, the mating pairs are chosen by humans. Um, all animals that we know about, that we, for which we've examined, have mechanisms for identifying close kin and avoiding breeding with them. They don't have the opportunity in a hatchery where they, they get their milk and their eggs bung together in a, in a pan by um, a well-meaning hatchery manager. But, but, but if, in, if in fact, the, in any given day or any given week, the individuals that return um, are more likely to have um, siblings um, present than in, um, in, in different weeks, then it raises the specter of inbreeding and inbreeding depression. And what I'm showing you here is empirical demonstration that in fact inbreeding is occurring in these salmon hatcheries and that it's causing a substantial amount of selection or, or fitness decrease. So the, the observed data are these, are, this is the, these are the relatedness coefficients of all of the returning adults um, in red. And in blue are the relatedness coefficient of all of the adults that were mated together. And what you can see is there's a big deficit right here right exactly at the relatedness um, level that corresponds to uh, half-sibling parents, um, in which the inbred matings don't return any adults um, back to the population. So, and we found this, we've replicated this in a number of different hatchery um, populations. So, another, and, and we can only learn about this because we've been doing full pedigree reconstruction on all of the fish that return here. Um, and um, through use of genetic tagging. Physical tagging is not gonna give you this. So yet another way that we've learned about the biology of these fish by doing, that, by doing the genetic analysis on them. Okay, I'm running a little bit short on time here, so let me just assess where I am and think about um, what it is that I am gonna talk about next. I really wanna tell you about this next bit, so I'm gonna tell you about this and I'm gonna then go right to the rockfish example on this, and I might have to leave out a little bit of the rockfish stuff at the end. So, um, and, and, and really, 
I, I realized after I put this talk together as I was looking over at it, uh, looking at it a little earlier that um, I've been using this term SNPs throughout without actually um, defining it or really uh, and just sort of assuming that everybody here knows what a SNP is and, and, and really it wasn't that important until this part of the talk. But what a SNP is is, is a, a simple um, difference in a DNA sequence um, that uh, is um, segregating in a population. So typically the vast majority of these SNPs um, have only two possible variants that segre segregate in populations. So um, many um, sites within your genome and the genome of salmon and all other organisms have two different variants present on the maternal and the paternal chromosome. This is a polymorphism. Um, millions of these in the human genome and in the trout genome. Um, and f for the last 20 years or so, there's been a huge push in genetics to use these SNPs over the microsatellites or um, other types of DNA sequences that people have used in the past to do, um, to do genetics. And, and, and in fact, all that work that I just told you about um, was all done with SNPs, these panels of 96 SNPs that get genotyped as single sites. And, and for the longest time, we've known that there's a lot of other variation in these DNA regions where these SNPs occur. And we've treated it as kind of a nuisance so that make sure that it doesn't interfere with the, our, our interrogation and our genotyping of this, this um, focal SNP. And we realized as we were searching for power um, to try to understand patterns in the ocean that this was just ludicrous, that we're throwing all this information out. And everyone was. Um, essentially, and um, that we needed to start trying to capture um, this haplotypic information because, so with a, with a single SNP in this region, there are only two possible alleles, two variants, um, whereas because of linkage disequilibrium or the non-random association of alleles at different genes, um, you can actually have, or, or a lack thereof, um, you can actually have up with these with three variable sites that are closely linked, you can have up to eight different um, variant alleles or haplotypes. So all of a sudden, we can take the same DNA sequence and transform it from a biallelic, a, a two-state um, genetic marker to one that has up to, eight mar up to eight different variants. And it turns out that some of the ones that we've uncovered in our rockfish project that I'm going to tell you about a little bit have up to 30 of these that are segregating. Um, so my colleague Eric Anderson, who's my partner in crime on this, um, has dubbed this haplotopia. <laughs> he likes these kind of flashy names. So, um, and, um, and, and really, um, w w all, all that it boils down to is this. We've got to start using this haplotypic variation, which we've historically treated as a nuisance, to turn these SNPs into multi-allelic markers. There are so many reasons to do it that it's kind of silly that people haven't done it up until now. As I just told you, a gene region with three of these SNPs can have up to eight haplotypes segregating in a species. Um, and f as a consequence, you need to um, really survey many fewer of them for similar inferential power as a single, uh, as a set of single or, or biallelic um, SNPs. And, and not only that, but multi-allelic markers can resolve some family relationships that biallelic ones can't. And that's a little bit of a technical issue, but I won't go into it. And standardization is really dead simple, harder. And this is more for the genetics crowd, but trust me, it's way, way easier. So um, not, not only that, but um, what we found is that um, these, if we choose our regions properly and we choose regions that are, um, that are highly variable, we can find um, sets of haplotypes that are um, informative in different parts of the range. One of the problems that we have with um, a lot of our SNPs is that they may, might be highly um, informative in California, but they're not informative at all in Alaska. So getting all of our colleagues uh, with whom we work um, you know, throughout the range of these species um, to use the same set of markers is really difficult. But it turns out that these haplotypic markers 
um, can use different variation in different parts of the geographic range to provide similar amounts of inference. And in fact, they do that. Um, and this is just a, a simple example from um, Chinook salmon um, from the Central Valley up to Alaska. And you can see how the allele frequencies different, differ here and the haplotypic variants differ. Th this is actually not a great example, but um, it was the one that I had that, um, that, that I think makes it quite clear. So in terms, why is this important? Well, it's important because it, as we start to work in these more difficult um, systems, um, you need all the power you can get. And um, the, because it turns out that almost every study of pedigree relationships in natural populations in the literature is underpowered and has not appropriately assessed their false positive rates. And, and I'm as guilty as anyone else until just the last few years of publishing work um, where the false positive rate was unacceptably high. So, and, and what you're looking at here is just from these 10 loci, we just took the, the, the best SNP um, in, in each population, the best SNP in um, one of our focal populations, the Feather River, and, and then all of the, um, the variation in the haplotypic framework here and, and did um, a simple um, pedigree analysis and calculated the false positive rate. And it's about um, anywhere from two to three times lower um, for the microhaplotypes just with 10 than um, with uh, just a single SNP. And, so, um, and what does that mean in terms of power for, for really um, difficult problems? So it means a lot. So um, the, uh, and, and I haven't even put it up here because Remember, I told you that 100 or 96 um, of these biallelic SNPs is enough to totally nail um, pedigree reconstruction when you have both parents sampled and you're trying to identify them. But if you only have one parent sampled, it's a much more difficult problem. And in fact, the, with just 96 SNPs with 192 alleles, you you're, th this, these look non-overlapping, but they're not. And in fact, given the number of comparisons that you need to do in a big project, it's a pretty unacceptably high false positive rate. Whereas, look at where the false positive rate goes um, when you consider all variation in these, 100, in these 96 um, gene regions around the SNPs. Um, and this is for kelp rockfish, so it's a different data set than I just showed you, but it's the one I'm going to tell you about in just a little while. Um, so all of a sudden, simply by, in, by taking account of all the other variation in these gene regions, we go from a place where we can't accurately identify um, parent-offspring pairs to one where we can do so almost without error. And a similar um, situation applies to the inference about full sibling relationships, which again, um, appears to be um, pretty, pretty comfortable here with 192 um, alleles, 96 loci, but it's actually not that. That area of overlap means that you're going to make a huge number of errors in, in a, moderate, a moderate or a modest size um, experiment because this is a false positive rate per comparison, not per actual um, uh, sibling sibship that's found. And again, you nail it when you look at all of the, the inference. So part of the reason why this was never um, really being taken into account is that we didn't have the software to do it. So graduate student in our group, Thomas Eng, has come up with a really amazing um, piece of uh, uh, GUI-driven software to call haplotypes from these, um, these, this additional variation. And you, you can... Um, find that by, um, well, if anybody's interested, I can send you the, the website. It's not published yet, but it's up on GitHub. Um, and, and so I've kind of told you all this, but just really, really a great, a, a great uh, advance. Pretty methodological, but, but what's, why I'm more excited about it is that um, I think it, it's really going to allow us to sort of democratize population genomics. And, and the reason that I, that I say that is that, um, we can now do uh, 
incredible inference with just a small number of gene regions that can be analyzed um, effectively and cost efficiently on uh, one of these smaller throughput DNA sequencers like the MySeq or the personal genome analyzer that um, applied biosystems cells. And, and you don't have to send your, your data off to one of these core centers or you know, your data, your samples and wait for weeks and, 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 and the cost is low and, and pretty much anybody can do this. So it's really been a huge step forward. Okay, so with my four minutes left, I'm gonna tell you about um, our first major um, application of this um, to rockfishes. Um, probably you guys all know this stuff, a marine species flock rockfishes, um, 50 species in Monterey Bay alone, more than that really. Um, and, and they're really quite um, unique, um, or, or quite, um, they have quite a unique life history amongst fishes, although not entirely, uh, in that they're live bearers internally fertilizing and they live for quite a long time. And we've been doing a whole bunch of different stuff with them. The one I'm gonna tell you about is estimating larval dispersal. So um, about 10 years ago, we um, formulated this idea that we were gonna try to measure larval dispersal combining, well, actually, um, combining sort of traditional marine ecology and um, the pedigree-based genetic tagging method that I told you about. And the idea here is we were gonna choose a species for which the adults are sedentary, kelp rockfish and, and a couple of its close relatives are very sedentary after they recruit. They don't move more than a few, m few dozen meters during their life on average. Um, so you can sample these individuals and if you find one of their offspring that has recruited, um, then you know where it started from and you know where it ended up. So you've estimated, you've got, you've determined it, its dispersal distance, its lifetime dispersal distance. This is one of the major questions in marine ecology. Um, and by doing so, you've done basically um, tagging, physical tagging of individuals, but given that a, a, a female rockfish will have a million or so um, offspring in her life, you've reduced the scale of the problem a millionfold um, by just sampling that one individual and you can detect all of her million progeny, or, or his as the case may be, um, when, uh, if you encounter it um, anywhere um, in the ocean. So, uh, so that's what we did, and here's our study area. Stillwater Cove, Point Lobos, um, Carmel Bay, and around Cypress Point up in the Monterey. Um, and I'm gonna rush through this here because I'm running out of time. So the first thing I wanna show you is the, um, the power of the microhaplotype panel. All that I want you to notice here is how every one of these blue dots, which is just the single snip that we started with, um, is well below the heterozygosity power for genetic inference of the entire haplotype in that gene region. So we got way more power. In some cases, heterozygosity went from 10% you know, up to 60% by considering all the variation. And the other thing, and, and I'm just gonna rush through this, it turns out that these markers are incredibly powerful for identifying species. Probably all of you know that larval rockfish are super difficult to identify as juveniles. And the big problem that we had here was how it was that we were gonna identify juveniles um, as we were um, doing this pedigree reconstruction in a way that wasn't gonna be throwing out three quarters, or, sorry, one third of the data because it wasn't the focal species. And it turns out that these markers both identify individuals and also give us the genotypes um, that we need to do pedigree inference in all of the different species. So huge sampling effort. This is for adults. Um, kelp was our focal species, but we also got a, a fair number of their other, um, their close relatives, gopher, black and yellow, and copper rockfish. Um, and for juveniles, even larger. I mean, these are a large sample size, a total of about 14,000 fish, um, about 12,000 of which um, were, um, act, were identified to, genotyped and were identified to species of origin. And what do we get for it? 
We got eight matches. <laughs> and here they are. This is hot off the press. Um, here's Point Lobos, Stillwater Cove, Cypress Point, Monterey, Hopkins, Pacific Grove. Um, we're working with uh, physical oceanographers who were sh stunned at the patterns here because we see all combination of dispersal trajectories here. We see individuals whose parents are in Monterey and the progeny are in Carmel Bay. We see individuals whose parents are in, Mon in Carmel Bay and their progeny recruited to Monterey Bay. We see self-recruitment within Carmel Bay. We see self-recruitment in Monterey. We see self-recruitment across Carmel Bay. Um, so the oceanographers are scrambling to look at places where there are sort of um, uh, anomalies in their model or where things like tidal driven um, or wave driven dynamics might um, be able to explain um, patterns that are not consistent with the, the, the vast majority of the water um, in the California current which is moving north. Okay, and um, so with that, I'm gonna, I was going to tell you a little bit more about rockfish, but um, that'll have to be another time. So, because um, I'm out of time, so I just want to stop by acknowledging um, all the people who have contributed to the work I've told you about, um, and uh, including the, the many, many fishermen who contributed um, samples to our big collaboration, and thank you all for your attention. Um, I don't know about Monterey Bay, but um, your question is one that we've been um, really struggling with in Carmel Bay, which was really our, our initial focal um, area. A and um, the answer is very, very large, and we're not really sure. So we, our, our collaborators on this, Mark Carr and his group, um, have uh, been doing transit surveys on scuba in Carmel Bay. Um, for years and trying to extrapolate to the entire um, bay and accounting for different types of rock and, and, and habitat features. And depending upon what assumptions they make about habitat features, the estimate is anywhere from 50,000 to 90,000 adult kelp rockfish in Carmel Bay alone. So that gives you some idea of what the scope of the problem is. And so our 2,000 individuals that we've sampled are just a tiny fraction of the possible parental pool. And that, for us, um, is, a, is an important parameter that we'd like to, to know better. Um, and so um, I wish I had a better answer for you, but at, that, at this point, we don't even know. We're, we're going to start to try to collect that information for the kelp rockfish habitat um, off of the northern, um, the northern part of the Monterey Peninsula. And then, of course, there's a huge area um, without kelp and therefore, which is not really kelp rockfish habitat. So, was that your question, more or less? Uh, is that a healthy population? Is that a good answer? I don't know what's going to be I think it is. I think it's quite healthy. Yeah, I mean, if you've ever been diving down in Carmel Bay, I mean, kelp rockfish are all over the place. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's you the uh, four species of rockfish separated out um, using the whole half Do you think that would be the case if you added a lot more species of rockfish in? You have to it is the case. In fact, we've got a separate project um, off that is developing that set of uh, markers into a, a more um, comprehensive um, ID tool, and, and it is much, much more powerful than the previous method that we that we published on in 2007, which we have been using since then for which uses microsatellite markers, much more powerful. Even um, so, you said it, it shows them separated out. It, it actually doesn't show 
um, gopher in black and yellow, rockfish separated out. Those of you who are um, rockfish heads, as somebody said, um, will, uh, will know that gopher in black and yellow are extraordinarily closely related. And in fact, um, it, it's, I think, an open question whether they're really even true spe truly separate species. Genetically, they're almost identical. They're just a small fraction of genes that can distinguish them. Luckily, um, we captured a couple of those genes in this panel. So even though um, you couldn't tell from the PCA plot that I put up, um, we can, in fact, distinguish gopher in black and yellow. But it's still an open question about whether they're reproductively isolated. And we do intend to look at that question when we move on to analysis of the um, gopher in black and yellow samples that um, are in our, in our collections. We, th this is, um, uh, a lot of this is the work of my graduate student, Diana Bacher. And Diana um, has just finished the analysis of the kelp rockfish and now is moving on to the analysis of the other three species. Given your um, agreement with the salmon fishermen up there um, in Tamasco Bay and the idea about splitting that one region into two, what, what would it take in terms of the data that you might collect that would facilitate such a division and therefore create, in effect, two separate fishery management areas? Yeah, um, good question. The, um, the, fi the fishery managers want um, more uh, they want larger sample sizes showing that there are distinct stock differences. So we, um, and, and I, I made reference to this in the first part of my talk, um, over the first few years of our study, we had a very striking pattern of differences in stock distribution north and south of Point Reyes, particularly for um, the, the um, ESA-listed um, coastal Chinook, which is found much more commonly north of Point Reyes, and the ESA listed a winter run Chinook, which is found almost exclusively to the south. Um, but in, in subsequent years, the pattern for coastal Chinook was less clear because of differences in the ocean. We're not sure exactly what. And so fishery managers um, sort of backed off. But, but, it, but it turns out that they actually do, it is now being managed separately de facto, even though um, they don't call it a separate management area, there are parts of the year where only the, the area north or the area south of Point Reyes is open in the San Francisco management area. And, and that's entirely to um, reduce harvest impacts on one of the two ESA listed stocks, which the, the available data and their modeling um, tells them will be more abundant either north or south of there. So the answer is fishery managers are creatures of habit and they hate changing the way they do things. Um, so I don't know that they'll ever want to split it even though it makes sense given that they can meet the same goal simply by um, having regulations that split it anyway. And, and the same thing happens in the south. So even though um, officially the fishery management area that's called Monterey goes all the way from Pigeon Point to um, the Mexican border. Um, most years, fishing regulations are different north and south of Point Sur. So. Well. Oh, we got one. More. Well, I was just wondering what kind of uh, work goes into identifying those those useful genetic regions that have that you're defining as the habitat. Oh. Um, we do next generation sequencing um, and we collect um, polymorphism data, variation data from thousands of genes and then we use bioinformatic tools to rank them in terms of their um, relative information content and, um, and the ability to, um, to get, um, uh, to, to, and just the, se the sequence um, requirements to turn them into markers. It depends what kind of fishery managers you're talking about. Like the, the, the staff and the managers of hatcheries and inland, um, inland uh, management are 
um, very, very interested and eager to and reach out to us all the time. The ocean harvest managers are um, creatures of habit who don't like to change the way they do things. And there is a, it's an extremely formal process. I was involved in it for a few years through the uh, Pacific Fishery Management Council. It's, it's a very difficult and contentious process which has a, a very large political component. So science is very, very useful, but it has to go through a super formal process of being submitted to the management council, or if it's a state managed fishery like halibut, for example, to the California Fish and Game Commission. And then you go through the process of having it be evaluated by their scientific advisory bodies and their fishing industry advisory bodies. And then it comes up to the full council where um, it's, a, it's a sausage making fest, basically. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah so th th we, we do communicate with them directly. Depending upon what the problem is, it's either they come, they're coming to us or we're going to them. So. Well, I think Carlos is going to stick around for some beer, as you are all invited to this happy hour. So if you've got any more questions, I'm sure you can ask them then. Otherwise, let's give a, a muslin round of applause to Carlos.